Uh, Fred mentioned that uh, Rebecca had been at Dymex since she was a baby. So that's not actually true. I knew Rebecca when she was a baby. <laughs> because um, long before, actually, long before Dymex, um, I, when was Dymex begun? Was that 19? 1989. 1989, okay. So this was actually literally before Dymex, not just before Rebecca went to Dymex. Rebecca was an undergraduate at Columbia. And I was a fresh PhD, and I was at Bell Labs. And I taught a couple of theory classes in the Columbia CS department. And I met Rebecca and convinced her to go to grad school in theoretical computer science. So, um, yeah. All right, so I think I could just take a bow now and not have to actually give a talk. Okay. So um, I'm actually not going to give a technical talk. I'm going to give a polemic, partly just a discussion of a socio-technical issue, partly just a provocation to get people thinking about this issue because it's something I'm obsessed with right now. And I guess I'd like to say that one of the reasons that I'm trying to work on socio-technical issues, and I said trying to work because I've actually discovered it's extremely difficult to do solid work on socio-technical issues. It's very easy to opine on them, but it's not that easy to actually figure out, technically speaking, what to do by way of work. I think Kobe's thought about this a bit, too, so maybe he'll have some good contributions to this whole thing. Oh, that's mine. Okay. Um, just ignore it. Okay. Um, if somebody brings the bag up here, I'll turn the, I'll turn the uh, ringer off. Okay. So, yeah, let me just turn the turn the the noise off. Okay, all right. So, so um, the issue that I want to talk about is um, something called exceptional access, and it has to do with the tension between ubiquitous encryption and lawful surveillance. Okay, so what exactly is the exceptional access question? So the exceptional access discussion that is playing out right now is sort of uh, reminiscent of what people in the crypto world call the crypto wars of the 1990s. So in the 1990s, that was, as you know, shortly after the end of the Cold War. And during the Cold War, strong cryptography and strong encryption technology generally was heavily regulated. In particular, there were extreme export regulations. Um, um, they were controversial even during the Cold War, but they did hold during the Cold War. And after the Cold War, um, industry, of course, said, great, now we can use all this in exportable products. And um, this was a, when the web was just becoming popular, so there was obviously a need for cryptography. Um, the US government didn't want to just deregulate cryptography. They wanted to require what they called key escrow. They said they want to have everyone who uses strong crypto uh, escrow or somehow deposit decryption keys with trusted authorities so that if government agencies, in particular law enforcement agencies, needed to decrypt ciphertext, they could. Now, this was horrifying to most technologists and civil liberties advocates, not all. In particular, many very prominent crypto people, not American, um, but in, from other countries where the relationship with the government and with surveillance agencies is different, uh, liked the idea, or at least could understand and sympathize with the idea of, of uh, key escrow. But most technologies, technologists and civil liberties advocates were strongly against this idea of key escrow. They said correctly that it would be very hard to implement securely and that it would advantage foreign competitors of US technology companies. At the time, and probably still, U.S. technology companies were very competitive, dominant globally, 
And the idea was if they are required to build products in such a way that U.S. government agencies can get access to ciphertext, can, can decrypt ciphertext and get access to private data, then there's going to be a lot of potential customers outside of the country, maybe even inside of the country, but certainly outside of the country who are going to cry foul and are going to start looking for um, products that are manufactured elsewhere where this feature is not mandated. So this was a very intense um, dis discussion. I, I don't know about the use of the word war here, but it was very intense. And the opponents of key escrow won. The government folded, which was quite interesting. But they just completely folded. At eventually, they just said, OK, we can't do this. All right, so that was um, more than 20 years ago. So what's going on now? Well, in the wake of the Snowden revelations, I don't know, I won't go into what the Snowden revelations were unless somebody does, wants me to. So in the wake of the Snowden revelations, the tech industry is rolling out a lot more encryption. It's basically sewing strong encryption, end-to-end -end encryption protocols, default encryption, into the communication and computing infrastructure. And um, in general, some of these, because these are default protocols, often the, ve the vendors themselves, maybe not because these are default protocols, but in, in addition to the fact that these are default protocols, often the vendors themselves, the manufacturers themselves, cannot decrypt ciphertext. The government can't just go to a manufacturer and say, we have a warrant to eavesdrop on so-and-so, tell us how to break into his or her traffic. Tell us how to decrypt his or her traffic. Okay, so. Um, often the, the, this, the, a, 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 a government agent, even with a warrant, is sort of stuck. If the, uh, the user, maybe even not intentionally, just by default, is using strong crypto in an everyday you know, messaging protocol and um, doesn't want to cooperate with law enforcement, the law enforcement agency cannot decrypt the traffic. So needless to say, law enforcement doesn't like that. The phrase that they're using is going dark. Okay? They no longer have visibility into whatever they need to catch and convict criminals. And they are once again calling upon vendors and manufacturers to help them. They want to build in what they call exceptional access features that would let the law enforcement agent uh, decrypt traffic or unlock a device if he has a warrant, but, it, but does not have the user's passcode. So vendors are objecting, saying that ex uh, uh, exceptional access will hurt the customer's security and privacy, and of course saying that you know, it would hurt their business. Just like in the 90s crypto war, they don't, think, you know, they, they don't think that their growth markets, which are all overseas, will actually materialize if their potential customers have to eat the fact that law enforcement is, US law enforcement is going to have access to their traffic. All right, so perfect example of this controversy was the FBI versus Apple case in the wake of the San Bernardino terrorist attack. James Comey, you know, with very typical FBI face. You know, those charged with protecting our people aren't always able to access the evidence they need. Okay, so he's basically saying that what's your problem? We have warrants. We are legally authorized to get this information. You just have to build the technology so that we can do what we are lawfully authorized to do. Why don't you do it? Tim Cook couldn't get a clear picture of Tim Cook. <laughs> I downloaded it from some place that I got to from Google, but it's all fuzzy. Um, the, so basically, he's saying that this is unacceptable, that we've built these crypto protocols into our products because our customers need them. Okay, If our customers are going to uh, conduct private conversations and conduct business, they need privacy. They need security. You're asking us, essentially, to attack our own customers. Okay? There is no precedent for this in US law. And um, notice that he said, our customers, including tens of millions of American citizens. So what was not said is, and all of our almost all of our potential customers, of course, are not US citizens. And you're going to kill Apple's growth pro prospects if you actually require us to do this. OK. so. 
We'll get to what actually happened in that case shortly. All right, so just a short uh, terminological point here. Um, the term exceptional access, I don't like that term. Okay, so anybody who's ever worked on security or on system design generally knows that the idea of exceptions is sort of a red flag that maybe there's something wrong with your design. Okay, exceptional access makes it sound to me anyway as though these access features are something that you put on at the end, put on to an existing design to handle exceptions that you really didn't think about when you were designing the thing from scratch. So I looked in the National Academies report and it says that the word, that this, this termino terminology was actually discussed and chosen very deliberately and it was chosen to stress that the situation is not one that was included within the intended bounds of the original transaction, but is an unusual subsequent event. Now, intended bounds of the original transaction, that is not a term of art in crypto and security. I don't know what that means, but it sounds fishy to me, <laughs> okay? So if these access features are to be provided, I would say they absolutely must not be treated as exceptions. They must be thought through completely from the beginning. And you know, dealt, you know, and, and proven proven to work as they are intended to work. So, I use the term law enforcement access because if we're going to build um, devices, if Apple and other vendors are going to build devices and protocols so that law enforcement has access, that shouldn't be an exception. That should be something that is thought about very carefully before it's done. Okay, so what is the pro law enforcement access? side of the encryption and surveillance policy debate. There are policy issues here. There are also technical issues. Well, basically, it's what I said. They think that the industry's post-Snowden embrace, I must have gotten that from somewhere, I don't know where, the post-Snowden embrace of default encryption is willfully thwarting lawful exercise of warrants. Okay, they keep stressing, look, you know, we understand the anger about the Snowden revelation, in the wake of the Snowden revelations, because there was just a lot of unauthorized bulk surveillance going on. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about executing lawful warrants, okay? There is something called the All Writs Act. Um, the text of the All Writs Act is there. It's a, a, a law from 1789 that essentially says that U.S. citizens, both individuals and companies, or at least it doesn't say only one or the other, um, are obligated to assist the government in the enforcement of the laws. Now, some people in the crypto community are very scornful of the idea that this 18th century law would um, you know, be considered a linchpin of one side of the debate in this 21st century technological controversy. But I think that's a very poor argument because, I mean, the Bill of Rights is 18th century law as well. You know, the fact that, that the All Writs Act is old doesn't mean it's irrelevant. And in fact, there is 20th century case law on the All Writs Act. Yeah, there but there's a difference between uh, legal legislation. With uh, what? The business of helping the government, uh -huh. I think, is, is, is the law. Okay, so you think that this should not be the law? I don't think so. Okay. By the way, uh, feel free to talk up now. I know we have dis time for discussion later, but I think we should have the discussion as I proceed. So if you have anything to say, just speak up. Okay, so, all right. So that's actually like one maybe important meta point. There's throughout this controversy, there's what is the law and there's what should the law be. Okay, now this is what the All Writs Act, which is the law, states. And I will come like shortly to the fact that while it does say that we are obligated to help the government, it's not very precise about the extent of the help to which that we are obligated to give the government. So this doesn't really settle the issue of what does the law require when the FBI says we need to be able to decrypt traffic. Okay, this doesn't really settle it, but it is a factor. All right, so the pro-law enforcement side was fleshed out extremely well by Susan Hennessy and Ben Wittes. 
And by the way, I have a, a bibliography in this set of slides. So if anybody wants to read any of this stuff, it's very easy to obtain it. OK. Uh, they, they did this in Lawfare blog, which is a, which is a fascinating forum. And where I often see very good articles written by right-wing lawyers who I expect to disagree with vehemently, but wind up agreeing with. So um, there you go. OK, now what is the anti-LEA side in the policy debate? All right, so I should say uh, technologists and civil libertarians who have written on this issue don't deny that ubiquitous default strong encryption could hamper legitimate law enforcement activity. They agree that that is a potential problem, but they don't think it's a reason to mandate law enforcement access features. So first of all, they just say, and I can't stress this enough, because this, as far as I'm concerned, might really wind up being the bottom line in this whole argument. But I'm not at the bottom line yet. I think there's a lot more work to do. But since 9-11, there's simply been too much surveillance. There's been bulk surveillance, some of it not even authorized. <coughs> but even if it were authorized, you know, there's just been too much surveillance. And the only sensible grassroots response to mass surveillance at this point is mass encryption. Like, we just have to fight back. There's just been too much surveillance. And one way or another, we have to ramp down the amount of surveillance. OK. Um, second of all, you know, encryption may thwart law enforcement, but encryption also thwarts criminals. Right? <laughs> so g useful, good sound encryption is just about the only weapon, the only effective weapon we have now in the fight against intellectual property theft, identity theft, and all kinds of other you know, theft and destruction of information online. So having citizens protect themselves using encryption is something law enforcement should actually applaud. All right, so if they could actually be convinced that the cost in the fight against crime to weakening encryption would be immense, perhaps they would drop this whole fight again. Okay. Anyway, so of course it is still true, as in the 1990s crypto war, that access, so-called NOBUS access capabilities, NOBUS stands for nobody but us, okay? <laughs> NOBUS capabilities would actually, could very well, probably would boost foreign competitors and hurt the US tech industry. Finally, this is what I was saying on the previous slide. Yes, the All Writs Act says that we're supposed to cooperate with the government in the enforcement of the laws, but it doesn't say how much cooperation is necessary. So one of the reasons that there is 20th century case law on the All Writs Act is that New York Telephone had helped, that was, this was all back pre-deregulation. Um, New York Telephone, part of the Bell System, uh, a lot of people in this room remember the Bell System fondly. Um, so uh, New York Telephone um, had helped the police in, so in one case. It had put what they call a pen trap or a pen warrant or something onto a particular line and, and kept track of all of the phone numbers that that, per that surveilled person was calling or that phone was calling. Okay. And then they, so that was fine. They were asked for assistance. They gave assistance. That was a case where the telephone company was actually involved. They were later asked to do exactly the same thing by the New York Police Department. And they said, no, this case has nothing to do with us. We, we don't want to get involved in this case. And it was litigated, and they lost. They were told, you have to do this because of the All Writs Act and because it's not a ridiculous imposition. You have this technology. You've used it before. It's not a big deal. Just do it. And they did it. OK. So that was not clear. That was not clearly. I don't mean clearly not. It was not clearly the case when in, the Apple, in the FBI versus Apple case. And so this remains you know, unclear. To what extent is the tech industry required to assist the government? OK? All right. Now, the, this anti-LEA uh, side is uh, expounded upon very, very well by a number of people, and in particular by Bruce Schneier and Susan Landau, who were part of a big group report and also wrote some individual statements on precisely these issues. 
there's too much surveillance, and hey, you know, we need encryption to fight criminals, and law enforcement should applaud us for doing that. All right, so what about the technical debate? All right, so I think that the thing that most technologists gravitate to immediately when they say mandated law enforcement access, what are you, crazy? That's not the way to build a secure system. What they're, what they're referring to is a basic fact of technology and how you can create security risks. Any capability that you build into your system, any technical capability, once it's there, poses a risk of being subverted. It poses a risk that the enemy will, will somehow figure out how to use this capability against you. Okay, so if there is some way to unlock a phone without knowing the user's passcode, it is possible that some bad guys will figure out how to use that unlocking mechanism without the user's passcode. Now, this idea that, that a technical capability built in to create security can be seized by the enemy and destroy security, that's not just a hypothetical possibility. That was exactly what happened in the Vodafone Greece scandal. The Greek government contracted with Vodafone to build a system that had wiretapping capability. So mandated by US law, that's the Kalia law. I'm not gonna get into that, but some of you might know about Kalia. All right, so the Greek government contracted with Vodafone to have a system that had wiretapping capability and then hackers broke into the system and used the wiretapping feature to eavesdrop on the Greek government. Yeah. Oh, it's a beautiful write-up. Google it. This, this is a very dramatic story, incredibly, incredibly dramatic story. Sort of a sad story. I think somebody committed suicide at some point. But anyway, it's a total soap opera, and it really happened. And this is not the only example. This is just the best-known example. So when they say, look, you build in this feature, you're taking a risk that it's going to be used against you, that's not just idle speculation. That could actually happen. And that might, in and of itself, be a sufficient reason to stay away from all of this. Okay, another reason might just be, hey, there's too much surveillance. <laughs> but, you know, so far, still under discussion. Um, more about the uh, anti uh, LEA, LEA, law enforcement access side in the technical debate. So there's a lot of vagueness about what exactly, you know, Comey's standing up there, you got to build it, you got to build it, you got to build what exactly? Okay, so first of all, uh, law enforcement has not quantified the extent to which the, all, of this new access, all of this new use of encryption is hampering it. We all agree it's probably making things inconvenient for law enforcement, but as somebody at a workshop that I was at in August pointed out, you know, the jails are still full, <laughs> okay? And cr the rates of violent crime are actually dropping. So, you know, I can't, I don't see a good argument that law enforcement is crippled without law enforcement access features to our ciphertext. Okay, so maybe you want to quantify, like, what exactly is it you need to do that you can't do? Okay, there was a DA at that, a New, uh, um, New York City DA at that same workshop who said that a murder victim had probably inadvertently filmed his own murder using his iPhone. And after he was dead, they couldn't unlock this phone. And he was going on about how this, um, you know, hampered them in their ability to convict the murderer. I don't know whether they actually ultimately convicted the murderer anyway. But after that, that talk, Steve Bellavin and I were looking at each other saying, you know, the number of times that one films, the, the, the ability to get access to, you know, an iPhone video of one's own murder, this doesn't sound like it's something that happens often enough to warrant a massive <laughs> software development effort. But anyway, okay. So no quantification. Yes. It's also one question how they knew there was such a video if they yeah. didn't actually see it. It could be that the, the murderer actually told them. Or it could be that there was another person in the room for some reason. And you would think that if there was a witness, that would be enough. It, the, whole, the whole story was very funny. It was just a really extreme point on the first bullet the, the take home message of the first bullet, which is there's, there's a desire for a lot more information about to what extent is this really a problem. 
Okay. So also, um, law enforcement often has other ways to get the information that it needs. And here's where we get into some stuff that, for me, clouds the bottom line. Okay. So one thing that law enforcement can sometimes do, and did for some of the information in the case of the San Bernardino terrorists, is get backup copies decrypted by a cloud service provider. Okay, there are, that, that particular phone was actually, until about a week before the attack, was backed up to the Apple cloud. And Apple can decrypt the information stored in the cloud. There are also corporate key escrow systems where people don't want to take, corporations don't want to take the chance that one employee could, you know, steal a laptop or somehow make it impossible for them to carry on with business after he leaves or after he dies or whatever. So they have decrypt, backup decryption capability. There's also just a lot of plain text. We're living in a world of ad-supported platform services. And those, those uh, platform service providers collect a lot of sensitive data in plain text form so that they can target ads. So if you can't unlock the guy's phone, maybe you can just go to Google or Facebook and get whatever information you need about him. And here's the real kicker. Often these things can be unlocked anyway. There are so-called gray hat hacking firms that create toolkits that use unremediated bugs to break into locked devices. Okay? This was, in f and, and this is for me a very, very controversial fact. And law enforcement and intelligence contracts with these characters all the time and makes use of all of their capabilities. And certainly in the case of NSA and other intelligence services, does the same thing, figures out how to use unremediated bugs in software systems and devices to unlock them or otherwise break into them or use them in ways that they're not actually intended to be used. This was the anticlimactic end to the FBI versus Apple case. FBI sued Apple saying we were compelling you to write software that will allow us to break in and then they found out, oops, never mind, we can break in anyway. Yes. Um, one would have to imagine so, right? I mean, I, they don't say exactly what they do. Okay, that's my that's one of the things I really can't stand about this situation is even my friends in the crypto community who really don't like LEA say, look, you know, you can always get in. It's a question of how much time and effort and money you're willing to spend, and then they don't reckon with the fact that. The firm that you're paying to do this for you is thwarting a lot of the efforts that the crypto and security community has always put forth. Namely, when you discover a bug, you should go to the vendor and have it fixed as soon as possible. I can't imagine that that's what Gray Shift or Cell Bright does because they make money from unremediated bugs. So, they also sell these capabilities to some pretty bad people. Is my is my guess? Again, this is all guess. They don't publish their, their techniques, and they don't say exactly what they do on their website. Okay, so we also don't know, we, not only do we not have quantification of the extent to which this is a problem, we also don't have a requirements document. Like, the law enforcement people haven't said exactly what are they trying, do they expect to accomplish. If they expect to be able to decrypt all ciphertext that they ever intercept anywhere instantaneously, obviously they're not going to be able to do that. Do they only want to unlock devices? Do they want to be able to eavesdrop in real time, you know, to decrypt in real time so they can eavesdrop on an ongoing conversation? Um, you know, what, what exactly do they expect to be able to do? Who is expected to do this? There are more than 15,000 police departments in the United States, many of them very small and technologically unsophisticated, let's put it that way. You know, is, are they all supposed to have access to this break-in technology? Um, so is it only um, U.S. law enforcement? Is this a NOBUS thing? Like, is it only U.S. law enforcement that technology uh, manufacturers and vendors are supposed to cooperate with? Or are they going to cooperate with law enforcement everywhere, including Russia and China and Iran and various other countries that the United States doesn't usually cooperate with? 
And if they don't cooperate with the law enforcement agencies in those countries, what's to stop criminals <laughs> from buying their devices in those countries? All right, so all these, these arguments are given very, very uh, fully and very eloquently in a couple of documents, a couple of sort of NRC report style documents that I have references to at the end. Okay, now, on the other side, there are actually people trying to, t solid technical people, trying to build LEA systems. Okay, so far we have only high level, high level ideas, not really fully specified proposals. Most of the ones that have been published and discussed target only the unlocking of devices. The, usually the unlocking of devices that are in the physical possession of a law enforcement agent with the manufacturer's cooperation, but without the user's passcode. So the best one is due to Ray Ozzy, who is um, a former, uh, I think he was the inventor of Lotus Notes, a former VP in Microsoft, and a very, very solid technical guy, like not somebody who's, whose ideas you could just dismiss. All right, so in his design, the device's encryption key is stored on the device itself, encrypted under the manufacturer's key. If, in, if a law enforcement agent has physical possession of the device, he extracts the encrypted key from the phone, sends it to the manufacturer, and the manufacturer decrypts the device and sends it back to the law enforcement agent. Okay? So they obviously, the law enforcement agent would have to convince the manufacturer that he has a duly authorized warrant, you know, and, and authenticate himself and authenticate the warrant. Okay, so an interesting feature of this is that once a device has been unlocked without the passcode, it bricks itself. And this is for tamper evidence. So everybody who uses this phone in the future or encounters this phone will know that it has, been, it has gone through this procedure. And it will also stop anybody who wants to alter the evidence on that phone from doing so. Okay, so there were, needless to say, as they usually are when a new security protocol is put out there, there were flaws discovered very quickly in Ozzy's protocol. That BB plus 18 is an article by um, uh, Steve Belvin, Dan Bonet, a bunch of, Ron Rivest, a bunch of very, very good people. Um, again, there were usually flaws in the first version of any protocol. It's not clear whether this basic idea could be built out into a solid protocol. Um, there are related ideas by Ernie Brickell, Stefan Savage, Matt Tate, and they were presented at an encryption workshop, encryption and surveillance workshop that I ran with Danny Weitzner and um, Timothy, oh, I'm spacing on Tim's name. Um, uh, he's a Brown University um, Watson Institute lawyer. Um, so we ran this workshop and um, saw a lot of ideas along these lines about how to unlock devices with a warrant and the manufacturer's cooperation. All right, there's one other um, proposal out there that takes a completely different approach due to Wright and Varia. Okay, so this is not targeted at devices. This is just a, a general methodology that would enable the, d the decryption of a limited number of ciphertexts for which you don't have the decryption key. You could use it in any application, any system. The idea is to deploy crypto systems with a key space that has less than maximum entropy. Okay? Then a very re well-resourced attacker does two things. A very expensive upfront computation called abrasion to narrow down the key space. And then a limited number of moderately expensive brute force searches for the keys for de to, for spe to decrypt specific messages, and that's called crumpling. The title of this paper is Crypto Crumple Zones. Crumple Zones, I think, are used to, um, for crash resistance testing of automobiles. So cri crypto crumpling is what they call this. Uh, any well-resourced attacker could do this. This is not for law enforcement only. It's not a nobis approach in any way. And it doesn't require law enforcement to cooperate with manufacturers or protocol developers. 
Okay, you could take all this and sew it into any existing protocol or application. Now, personally, um, when I read what they meant by extremely expensive abrasion, that that could be up to $3 billion of upfront cost to enable a limited number of decryptions, my first thought was $3 billion could buy a lot of law enforcement. <laughs> and um, I guess back to they have to quantify their problem. I, I have a, a lot of skepticism that the best way to use it, if you have three, ad three billion additional dollars, that the best way to use it would be access to locked devices. But who knows, it's a, it's a technically interesting and different approach. All right, my position in the law enforcement access debate. I'm convinced by all of these criticisms of the vague demands by law enforcement that this is not something that should be done at this time. We just simply don't have a way to precisely specify what we're going to do and prove that it could be done securely. Okay, we don't have enough, we don't have the requirements document, and we also just don't have any answers to this. Okay, well, what's the scale of this? What's the jurisdiction? You know, et cetera. All right. So I also just, part of me just thinks this is a bad idea. Okay, just, you know, the, the, the sort of the anti-surveillance the anti knee-jerk uh, response is very present and active in me. Okay, however, I also think that we shouldn't just drop it once and for all. We're having, we, we, at this crypto workshop that we ran, we had this horrendous experience of constant um, jeering and heckling from the crowd. Don't talk about this. Don't say this. Don't give them ideas. You're being played. The government is going to say that the tech community is divided on the wisdom of exceptional access. Don't do it. Don't say it. That was the first time in my very long career that I'd ever encountered censorship or attempted censorship, and it was really mind-blowing. It was just absolutely amazing to me that, that this was happening. Okay? So what do I mean when I say I think it deserves further study? All right. So the Why status... What? Why do you think it was happening? Why are they trying to censor us? Um, so they fundamentally don't believe that any good can come out of the study of law enforcement access. They think that even if a very technically solid design were arrived at and all kinds of safeguards were put in to make sure that it was only used lawfully and rarely, that you know some child would get kidnapped and we'd have in the press children, 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 and they would throw away all the safeguards. They also just, which I, I think is actually probably true, okay, they don't want to help the government. They just, they believe that, especially in the post-Snowden world, but even before that, the U.S. government just isn't trustworthy, and you don't want to give them more power. They have more power, they have enough power, they have too much power. And, um, I think some of them are perfectly comfortable with the status quo, and I'm going to explain what, I, I've sort of hinted at it already, where the, t where the disagreement is between me and them. Okay? So, Jonathan Zittrain, another fuzzy picture, said, I empathize with the idea that how much the government can learn about us should not depend on the cat and mouse game of technological measure and countermeasure. So this idea of, well, try to get a warrant, try to get the guy to cooperate. If you can't, ultimately, you just break in. You know, you just go to Gray Shift or Cellbrite or whoever you can buy stuff from and break in. He says, I don't like this idea of the cat and mouse game. Ideally, a polity would carefully calibrate its legal authorities to permit access exactly and only where it comports with the imperatives of legitimate security. Once you say it's okay to deal with the gray hat hackers, you can't really believe they're only going to do that when it's lawful. Okay, I can't really believe it. I think once you say it's fine to deal with these middlemen who sell hacking tools to the highest bidder, you've left behind only lawful surveillance, only stuff that's accountable to the voters. Okay, so I think that that's a difference. 
There are people who work in the industry who say, I'm being naive when I say, don't deal with gray hats. Okay, anybody who does encryption professionally for real deals with gray hats. That's what they say. I think that's really the fundamental clash between people in the crypto community who otherwise get along very well. Okay, so I don't think, as I was just saying, that it's perfectly okay to say, you don't need this FBI because there's a lot of plain text out there and because you can always hack in anyway. I don't think there should be a lot of plain text out there. I, I, uh, throughout all my time in working on crypto, I've said everybody should be encrypting everything, all of your sensitive data. As an individual or an organization, you should encrypt everything. You should not leave massive amounts of sensitive data around in plain text form. And yet, here are my, con here are my um, you know, colleagues in the crypto world saying, you don't need to decrypt or, or unlock phones. There's plenty of plain text out there. We don't want there to be plenty of plain text out there. Also, I don't like this idea that the bottom line is, well, if you really need to get into a locked device for legitimate law enforcement purposes, you can buy some kind of unlocking tool from, uh, from Grayshift or Cellbrite or whoever. I also think that there's an opportunity for the crypto community to much more carefully analyze this whole situation and make a much more precise argument about why LEA can't be done securely. I mean, what I said before about, well, there's this whole bunch of, of proposals based on essentially the idea that you need an authenticated warrant and a manufacturer's key. And then you have to build out from there, okay, exactly how to sew that into the whole eavesdropping and, and warrant, warrant execution process. Authenticated warrant, courts run on paper. <coughs> There's no such thing as warrant authentication right now. So if that's really the way they want to go, ASI style proposals, if they're serious about it, they would require an authenticated warrant. That would take years of development and years of cultural change in court systems. Okay, that in and of itself might be a solid argument for why you don't want to do it. Okay, because the expense of that and the uncertainty of that would be enormous. Finally, I just want to say that while technically I think we could make a much more precise argument, and we haven't done it yet, and it pains me that you know people I, I really respect who usually traffic in solid arguments are just saying, well, what about this? What about that? What about jurisdiction? You know, what about um, scale? Blah blah blah. They don't. They could be a lot more precise than that. But there's also a social and political situation that they are not dealing with, in my opinion, very realistically. So I've, I've taught a couple of classes in which we've discussed this issue. And I'll have to say that in my experience with Yale students, um, many of whom do not have any like extreme affection for the US government, many of them are not American citizens, but even the ones who are don't have any extreme affection for the US government. And many of them are very technically knowledgeable. And they just don't see the idea that this is an illegitimate thing to mandate. They say the government regulates all kinds of products for the sake of public welfare. Why are you saying it's obvious the government should not regulate cell phones and laptops and you know computing and communication? Private communication. That's why. Okay, but that is not obvious to people. Why not? Because there are people who think that law enforcement is important and that if they need certain capabilities in order to catch and convict criminals, the technology industry has to take that need seriously. That's a very old argument. How can it be so obvious? Right. To catch criminals, you need to... Right. To and you know that it hasn't been discarded yet. What I'm saying is not I agree with that. I'm saying you cannot, if you're serious about putting this issue to rest, at least for another 20 years, you can't just dismiss it. Because a lot of very responsible and, and, and influential people have sympathy with that argument. So as I said, the tech, the tech landscape has changed a lot since the 1990s. So it's not clear what effect the changes have had 
on the feasibility and the desirability of LEA. And there's a lot of people who weren't even born yet when the 1990s crypto war took place. And they don't, it's not obvious to them that LEA is not something that's worth doing. Okay? The other thing, so, and it strikes them as arrogant for the tech industry to say, you know, you can't tell us what to do. Because all kinds of industries are told what to do. Okay. Now, the other thing is they don't see intuitively why it's infeasible. Like they say, similarly to what I've been saying, what is wrong with building a device? Um, Jason talks about secret sharing. Uh, with secret sharing, there are things called access structures. Okay? And monotonic access structures are well understood and implementable. Why can't you build a device that could be unlocked either with the user's passcode or with the conjunction of warrant authentication and the manufacturer's key? Conceptually, that makes perfect sense. Yes, it might be hard to develop that technology, but why are you telling me it can't be done? It seems to me that could be done. My students say things like that to me. And yeah, maybe it could be. We don't yet have the infrastructure to do it, but maybe it could be. So I think we need to go deeper. We need to have more precisely stated problems. And you know, as I wrote in my last sentence of a CACM viewpoint column that's going to come out in a couple of months, I wrote, if we're going to claim it can't be done, we have to be very precise about what the meaning of it is. And these people who should know better have not been precise about what the meaning of it is. OK, so I think we've actually already had discussion. But if anybody else has comments or questions, that's fine. We can have some questions now or we can actually have a break. <laughs> so, if I may, here's a naive question. <coughs> for, for 200 years in this country, we've had the idea that a policeman can show up at my door with a piece of paper and it says a search warrant. And that Policemen or police women can then search my house, and if I obstruct that, it's big trouble. And that warrant is, you know, it's a piece of paper with some judge's signature on it. So why is the system of authenticating warrants such a big deal now? Why can't a policeman show up at Apple headquarters, say, here's my warrant, I want to see your general counsel, and have this Aussie procedure go through? Well, you could do that up to a certain point. That doesn't scale. That doesn't scale very well. Okay, so maybe if the fact that you need physical possession of the device and you need a policeman to show up with a warrant uh, is is required, that will be a good thing in that it will um, sort of inherently limit the number of times this procedure is invoked. OK, but unlike, okay, um, unlike uh, people who uh, traffic in like cop shows and uh, a, 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 a policeman showing up at your door, Technology people, in particular crypto and security people, are not prone to just accept at face value, hi, I'm a policeman, I have a warrant. Okay? It's totally obvious how that could be subverted. Right? It's totally obvious how someone could impersonate a policeman and um, you know, sort of fake a warrant. If you have to have a cryptographically strong authentication procedure, and there's no reason you shouldn't, because you're talking about digital devices here. Then it's not enough for somebody to show up with a piece of paper. They actually have to be able to verify the judge's signature, and they have to have a certificate that proves that that was actually the judge's key that signed it. OK, but even so, right? I, you know, if you have the, the most sophisticated bank in the country, right. right, and there is a search warrant for your safe deposit box, yep. The bank is not going to say, well, you know, you could have gotten that cop uniform from a costume store, right? Oh, I think not. they will. I think they would. If there's a tremendous amount of money involved, they will not take for granted that somebody who shows up in a cop's uniform is a cop. Right. So we, 
So right. there already is a system for doing this exactly. non cycle work. Okay, no, I totally agree. I have been saying since I heard, first heard this can't be done, asserted without specifics and without proof, look, I don't understand. Isn't this basically a key management problem? Now, I understand key management is hard. It definitely is hard. But, you know, the financial system uses key management technology to protect trillions of dollars of transactions. And they occasionally have slip-ups, but they fix them. And the whole system doesn't go down because of poor key management. In fact, when we had an almost crash of the whole banking system 10 years ago, it had nothing to do with key management. <laughs> okay, So I, I agree with you, and that's sort of what my students' skepticism is expressing, is, look, we understand how to do, in principle, how to do warrant authentication. Okay, We understand, in principle, how to do key management. Why are you saying it's obvious that it can't be done in this application? And I think it's not obvious. I think it's not obvious at all. Yeah. Sure. So a, a police can search your home, but they cannot have a warrant to search your brain. <laughs> so this, yeah. then we, we can replace the justice system. I mean, taking this to extreme. Right. But taking, the taking things to extreme, anything. Anything that serves as a replacement of the justice system, of, of, the, of the very values of the society. If, if we go at the level of having warrants for searching our brains. And yeah, but with I mean, these are machines potential in a year or two from now, they may be recording your brain activity there. Very well matched. He is recording. I just wanted to make a, 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 a point that this problem is much broader than the specific issue you, you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So we have a project here on cyber forensics. Mm -hmm. uh, and in particular, the training of law enforcement on cyber forensics. Uh, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center has had an explosion in the number of cyber forensics courses that they teach. And it's not just police departments. There's the Coast Guard Investigative Service the U.S. Postal Investigative Service, et cetera. And it, there's nothing that uh, uses a computer that is safe from the government wanting to get into it. Uh, there, there's a big emphasis in trying to look at the computers in your vehicles, for instance. Uh, there are specialized courses in how to do that. But and there was a Supreme the Carpenter case, the yeah. Supreme Court case recently. Uh, there are also all kinds of issues with uh, new career pathways in law enforcement uh, for technological people and new certifications and all that sort of stuff. So the cat is out of the bag. The question is, is you know, where do we go? With well, that? okay. And so I think on the one hand, it's totally unsatisfactory to say all these devices have to be built in such a way that somebody who shows up with a warrant physically or digitally or both gets to break in. On the other hand, I think it's less satisfactory to say we refuse to touch this. We, the people who know the most about cryptography, refuse to touch this issue because we assume that any government agency agent who really needs this information can buy a gray hat hacking tool. Okay, That, I think, is completely unacceptable. That's not a response as far as I'm concerned. Okay, break. So, I guess let's thank you again.